Okay, welcome to another episode of the Rugby League Outsiders. My name's Craig. And my name's Carl. And we've got a great guest with us today, which is uh, Richard Jones of the Brixton Bulls. Really excited to talk to him. He's also got another role, which is, just remind me what your other the, role the is. The chairman there. of the London Rugby League Foundation. Sounds amazing. Right, we're going to get into guys. <laughs> get Thanks get for into having that. me. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, right, best best way to start is, uh, obviously, we're down here in London. Um, not a traditional heartlands for, for rugby league. How did rugby league end up on your radar? And what kind of brought you to be sitting on this chair today? So for me, so I'm from Blackpool, uh, but my dad's from Warrington. All right. So uh, we used to go and watch Warrington all the time when I was a young lad. Uh, my dad had season tickets there. So, so we were going there for years. And then uh, I moved down to London in, in 1997 and I've been living here ever since. And so, so I've been following rugby league uh, that whole time. So, so, you know, when I had the chance to get involved, I wanted to get involved. Was it a woman that brought you to rugby league, uh, to London? No. no. Oh, all <laughs> right, okay. It was a job. <laughs> that was it. That, yeah. that, that was kind of a common theme we've had with everybody. That's, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, it's not nothing as exciting <laughs> as that. It's just a, just a job. The, broke the cycle there. <laughs> Okay, so it'd be you know great to just talk to us a little bit how you how you got aligned with Brixton Bulls. Did, have you played? Did you play there, or you know what's? No, what's so I started. Uh, I, you know, I I got two lads who are now fourteen and and ten. So when the little one, he was he'd been going to like little local mini rugby stuff on on the park, and uh, when he started getting to five or six, we want to start taking him to a proper club, and so I started looking around. Obviously, there's loads of rugby union clubs. Yeah round here but I had a look around and Brixton Bulls Rugby League Club was not very far away down the road so we thought we'd go and go and play there and so we we he started playing there when he was five or so and so I said well if you're looking for any help I'll help out and, yeah. and we've been doing that um been doing that ever since so and that's worked well for us so I, you know so I've then got gradually more and more involved in the whole thing and around the same time uh I'd also been in been asked if I could get involved in the, in helping the London Rugby League foundation as well so the, the london rugby league foundation which used to be the london broncos yeah. foundation and then when broncos originally um left super league that got kind of reorganized yeah. and and i happened to know a couple of people and they asked me if i could help out with that so i became a trustee of that since then so i've been doing the two things um uh, been doing the two things ever since and uh, Rick, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on to the foundation stuff in a bit. Let's, uh, we'll concentrate yeah. on, the, on on sort of Brixton uh, to start with. Um, is your role? Are you involved in the coaching setup of things, or are you, you know? That, are you, yeah, uh, so I so I'm the effectively the head of the junior section, the minis in the junior section. Yeah, so I help oversee all of those different teams. So we got teams from under sevens through to under fourteens. Right, and then I coach the under fourteens uh, primarily, and I'll also help coach the under twelves. Um, a little bit as well so I've been doing that so my older lad is in the under 14s group so I've been mainly coaching his age group as they've gone all through the years and yeah. then my little lad who's who's an under 11 and he'll play in the under 12s this year and so I'll be dragging him and a few of his mates down and helping out with that as well and we sort of spent the day learning about um, the community game within London what sort of how many sort of teams do you sort of play against uh, in, the, in the junior league so in the junior league so, so uh, the under 14s last year I think there were eight yeah. Uh, so you got seven teams that you're playing again. So we're playing home and away games, and then we play the semi-finals and the finals and the playoffs. Um, so the under 14s, under 16s has, has stayed pretty strong. Under 12s for the last couple of years has been more like four or five. Uh, but you know, you got five teams in there. Then you got four teams you play home and away. Then you got eight fixtures on that. You then got your playoffs cup and your whatever and, yeah. you got after and a couple of cup games and a nines competition or whatever. So, so in general whether it's 12s or 14s or 16s, they'll end up playing, I don't know, 10, 12 competitive matches. And I think one of the things that, that is a, a big deal for us, and it does actually stand out relative to the rugby union setup, is playing proper competitive matches week in, week out, in a real competition for a trophy, which I don't quite know why, but the union clubs don't seem to be doing particularly. So it is one of the, actually the, the big advantages that we've got. And it's, you know, so once they start playing at 14s and 16s, it's proper competitive yeah, yeah. stuff at a pretty decent level and, and people aren't mucking around. So when you say that it doesn't seem that Rugby Union are doing that, so what, are their games kind of watered down? Have they got less fixtures? What, what they is tend this? to have slightly less fixtures. 
Um, and they tend to be in a, a slightly less competitive format. Yeah. And then they, they play, then go into different leagues or whatever. But they, they don't seem to have quite the same intensity and regularity around that. So, uh, you know, they've obviously decided that's the way that they, they want to do it. We find it works well for us for then the high performance players out of that one of the attractions of them playing rugby league during the summer is playing regular competitive yeah, yeah, fixtures and then everything that, that flows on from that well, I think kids have got to be they've got to be playing aren't they ultimately that's what that's what well, they've got to be do. playing so you know more than anything else we just want them playing so you know we try to run a set at where in our in our little kids sessions it's fun sessions and they're learning some skills but more than anything else they're just having a good time and most of that most of them will be coming along half of them never even heard of rugby at all before they're coming along because it's round the corner and it's handy and their mate goes and it sounds like fun and they're doing some stuff and hopefully they're picking up some skills along the way then under 11s under 12 starts getting a little bit more serious and they start playing more com proper competitive games and then for 12s 14 16 we start then having a more um more competitive and serious environment around the whole thing but but more than anything else we're just trying to get them to play Mm. And the Brixton Bulls, obviously, you 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 haven't been involved with it since the start. No. Um, but w what do you know about the history, and what can you tell people so about this the is, history so of the club? This is the twentieth anniversary. Oh wow! So two thousand and four is when it's set up. So it's obviously it's a little bit before my time. So I've been involved in it for whatever eight eight nine years, um, yeah. something like that. So and really, it, it was they had two young age group sides that started off at under eights and then went all the way through from there. And some of the people who were involved in that are still involved in the club. So Philippa, who's the, the um, president and she runs the juniors with me as well. And she's also the chair of the London Junior League. So she's been doing it since then, just helping out. That was before she even had kids involved I've in it herself. I've heard her name mentioned quite yeah, a few so, times. So she's yeah. done a phenomenal job with a couple of other people, Wilf and Alison, um, Thomas Smith, who've done an amazing job from the beginning and, and their lads went all the way through from under eights. Their younger lad then ended up playing for the England Community Lions at under 18s and, and all that kind of stuff. So they've been going for years, but they they struggled to make to build it beyond those two young age groups that then went all the way through. Yeah. You know, they, they were struggling for places to play, you're playing out of the park half the time, it's jumpers for goalposts. And then yeah. um, it, it was just difficult to really build it beyond that. Then I think there were a couple of guys um, eight, nine years ago who had come down from university. One of the guys happened to be the Oxford University rugby league captain. He'd come from St. Helens and there are not that many of them. He happened to move around the area. So yeah. he's like, well, let's get a men's team going as well. And so they managed to get a men's team going, which has then been hugely successful and done really, really well. Um, Philippa's lad, who also turned five at the time, so she got the minis going Again, I got involved a little bit just after that. Uh, and so then we built all of that from there. And then we managed to, we, the Lambeth Council actually helped us out with a ground, helped us out with a ground for a while and we had a place to play. And so we managed to build up and managed to keep those year groups going through. Those young lads had then started playing for the men's. And then the big thing last year was um, we had another guy called Pablo who, who started coming along with his lad. He's an Australian guy a few years ago. And, uh, Pablo's done an amazing job and got the Masters going oh, last right. year. So oh, the right. Masters has been massive. So they've now got 30, 40 guys regularly turning out doing that as well. So, you know, so all of that, there's been a lot of people over a long period of time putting a huge amount of work, but, yeah. but just getting more and more people playing. So, you know, so it's been generally, it's gone pretty well. If you were to describe the Brixton Bulls kind of club culture or what it means to be a a Brixton Bull, what, what would you describe it as? Uh, more than anything else, I'd say inclusive. Yeah, brilliant. Number one thing is inclusive. So, you know, I think we'd have a good shout of being the most diverse rugby club in the country. I think we're 35% from minority ethnic groups. I think our breadth of uh, income, wealth, demographics, however you want to define it, is probably the broadest that you can possibly imagine. You know, we got really wealthy areas near us. We got very deprived areas near us and, and we're trying to make sure that they can all Get come on. and play. Yeah. They all come and play. They have a very welcoming environment. The membership subs are, f are voluntary and we just make that work. And so we just make sure that, that anybody and everybody 
can come and play. That's incredible. That's I, I think that's probably one of the first clubs we've had that said uh, memberships are voluntary. Ah, so we, we say to people, you know... It, that it, must be incredibly difficult to uh, to fund a club and keep a club going, yeah, it's, though. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy. So we've obviously got... I mean, we were held for a while because Lambeth weren't charging us for a period of time. So yeah. we were able to get some people to pay some subs within that. Uh, and we weren't having to pay for fees for pitch hire, so that helped. Um, that then has ended. We are now paying kind of full pitch hire at a, at a rugby union club, which we have a very good relationship with with us but obviously then there, there are costs associated with it but you know so we say to people if you don't want to pay don't pay if you you only want people who are, who are happy to pay who are able to pay um to do that if if that's an issue it's not a problem we just can make sure that everybody can pay and, and we try and make it work and and people by and large if they're able to then they're paying there's people not yeah. trying to scrimp away from it which i also think speaks volumes for for all of those people that that they are prepared to do that mm. so I mean, is it a, an area for like player recruitment that you actually target some of the, you know, the minority groups? Um, not explicitly, explicitly, but in that area, the, the demographic is very broad. So, um, I mean, our players will come from lots of different, uh, different places of, of where they've heard of the club from. So, you know, some of them are mates of mates that we've been dragging yeah. in off the streets for a long time. Some of them will be seeing local flyers in a, in a shop on Streatham High Street. Um, some of them will be, you know, I run quite a few of the, the local schools competitions. So we'll run the year seven, eight and nines for the champ schools competition in the area. I'll run the uh, Lambeth or Southwark year five and six um, tag rugby competitions and, and things like that and so we'll get a few people so that is you know genuine proper local primary school yeah. stuff in there and a lot of the kids who are playing in the tag rugby and that never heard of it Yeah, genuinely never heard of it and then you come up you know there's some amazing athletes mm. in there and you, you just pick up the ball and run and they're just brilliant now now it, he's not then automatically thinking alright well the next thing I want to do is go and find the local rugby league club and go and do that and so then you're trying to encourage them and support them and, and, and trying to get as many of, of, of those guys coming along as well. And uh, and then there will be local rugby union players. And, and so we have quite a lot of who, who play a bit of both. And um, we've been sending as many from who had never played rugby union before into local rugby union clubs. And then then That's vice fair. versa in the summer, they're coming back as well. And so, act, you know, so we actively try and build on those bridges as well. So a combination of all of those things, whether it's, Schools, local rugby union clubs, just flyers on the streets and just mates of mates from all over the place. That That's kind of where we built the numbers from. And uh, it does mean that within that, you get a pretty diverse group of people um, who are coming to play. Rick, if you look, if we look at uh, London Rugby League a little bit broader, uh, to take our question in that way, how do you think Community Rugby League is going in London? How, how, how do you think it's developed over the last sort of five, ten years? Um, so I think it's really good, uh, but I think it could be better. Right. And I think while it is very good, it is also can be slightly precarious. So it still needs help, as much help and support as it can be. So there's something like 20 odd, there's a bit over 20 clubs in the whole region, yep. London and the South East. Uh, some of those will range some of them will just have a men's team some of them might have a couple of teams some of them might have masters some of them will have women some of them will have wheelchairs some of them will have kids there's not many that go all the way through yeah from under sevens through to everything um, so Brixton would be one of the more extensive in terms of coverage of that and help with the masters last year uh, Elmbridge would, would be one of the more extensive within that there's not many that that are really going all the way through um so it, it's absolutely enough for whether it's in men's or women's or primaries or wheelchair or whatever it is it's absolutely enough for really good competitions yeah within that and a really good landscape but were it to drop much below that yeah that would start being Start to problematic so right, you, yeah. you're not that far above critical mass in in a lot of it so um 
the primary section, I would say, has been a particular area of concern. So if you take it back from, I don't know, mid 2000s, something like that, the RFL actually did a lot of investment, community development, helped set up a lot of the community rugby league clubs that still exist today, did a lot of schools development work, the London Broncos Foundation took on, carried on a lot of that stuff. Then even when that became the London Rugby League Foundation, for a period of time, there was still actually quite a lot of funding um, that did come via the RFL, and it was a particular part of the old deal with Sky was a certain amount of funding was fed into foundations and community groups. So there was quite a lot of funding. From, I think it's 2018, a lot of that funding was just pulled. It just finished. Right. The Sky deal on that deal ended, and it was just not replaced. Since then, the number of pr registered primary players, has got, at that time, there were 600 registered primary players across 14 clubs. Last year, there were 60. Wow. And two clubs accounted for 50 of them. Oh, right. So at the primary level, you know, I, I, we can go out and get kids to come and play primary rugby league, and Elmbridge, to be fair to them, also do a great job of it. And, getting kids come to play primary rugby league and there's a few others who are, who are working really hard to do it but there's you're starting to run out of people to play it starts becoming a, yeah. a, a difficult now at the end of sevens nobody's that bothered because they're not they don't want to travel around yeah. going to play with anybody but under nines under elevens it starts being um, an issue that you can't drop below that you've got it, it's not really happening at all so so that area particularly so I mean at the foundation we're trying to encourage more people to do it the RFL are trying to encourage more people to do it we you know our sense is that there are more of the clubs who are all trying to do it but it's not easy so because you used to have a setup where the RFL and the foundation effectively were funding development offices to go into a load of local schools and get in, in where areas where community clubs were yeah. and then get those kids to come along and play and then you could drive numbers through that so they, so the point then they were running sessions across that would touch 8,000 kids across a couple of hundred you know a few hundred primary schools that's just not able to happen anymore so and the, the extent to which the foundation exists these days it's basically me and a handful of other trustees we do an event every year to try and raise and raise a few thousand pounds and then we're able to give out a few you know it's hundreds of pounds of grants to yeah. the clubs to try and help them but it's now at that kind of scale yeah okay rather than um rather than a, being able to do it on a on a proper level that that you can really really drive proper numbers through as as the broncos reaching the super league helped at all this year have you, have you well seen i think it's helped numbers? massively yeah, yeah i mean we'll we'll see as the season goes on but you know there is a a real sense of excitement about being back in the super league and you know, because obviously the Broncos have been in different locations for a, for a long period of time. There's, and the last time that they were in Super League and they're playing out of Ealing Trail Finders, which was not a you know big, what you might think of as a big professional Super League um, stadium. If there were only certain areas to sit. It was there weren't actually very many community clubs that were anywhere near it so this yeah. is the first time that they've been back in Super League first time in a long time they've been back in Super League playing in what is actually a really really good stadium in an area that I think is a, a good location and you know I think there has been a, a palpable sense of excitement um, around that and around going to the games and hopefully we'll see a, a big crowd um, tonight I think it's been tempered slightly by you know then the IMG grade announcement comes out and you're a bit like, well, now I, I don't know if there's a bit of a sense of, well, we're definitely going to go and watch them this year then. Yeah. Just don't know if they're ever going to be back in Super League after that. But so we'll definitely make an effort on that. Um, it was also tempered slightly by then what um, happened with the academy and the scholarship structure, which has been an important pathway for people wanting to play junior league in London. Now, I, I then actually think they're doing a really, really good job of putting in place replacements for that, which I think actually make a lot of sense and, and work, will work really well for the region. But, you know, you've had those kind of two things also in the side as well as the Broncos getting back in Super League. But the Broncos getting back in Super League is a massive deal. Mm. Um, 
So I, you know, I've absolutely no doubt it, it's driving loads more just awareness and general interest, which is good for everybody involved in in London Rugby League, of, of people being wanting to be involved in the game. So, is there anything rugby league wise you would like to see happen in London to to drive the profile up? You know, would would you like to see a magic weekend come to London? Would you know? Is, is there any? I think, I think, firstly, I think there's loads of things. So I don't think there's no magic bullet. No, of course, in all no. Of this. There's, it's loads of things. But so. If I was to say, right, Rick, you're in, you know, in what, you're, one enterprise, what, what would it be? Yeah. Um, I mean, again, you, you're going across, so, you know, I think they need to do a whole load more around general media profile and, and awareness around particularly more effort on the, the local and the London media around that because you know, with the best one in the world the coverage of that and the London Broncos getting back in Super League not been massive I think you need to do uh, more support for the London Broncos and take a if you want to take an actual strategic view on that and we can come back on to you know IMG and whatever and how that's helped and the couple of peculiarities around that more support for the community clubs more support for the actual schools competition which has got a little bit of a foothold but you know could be a really really big deal more support for the universities and all of that if there's one particular thing within that, 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 so I've always wondered about whether magic could be work well down here. You know, I think there are other events in London that generate big crowds. People go into them because they're just an event weekend. You know, and so a good example would be the Rugby Union Sevens that they do in yeah. at Twickenham that'll that'll have forty. 50,000 people turning out for because they're going for a party day out. Yeah. I mean, Navy, the, another one. Yeah, and, and, and things like that. So you've got other events like that that work well here that I think potentially that's one that potentially could work well. I don't know if it's the right one or not. Um, I don't think they've been anywhere near enough internationals in London in the last 20 years. I mean, no, so when I, I was a lad. I, I agree. And 1990, 1992, 1990 at Wembley, 1992 at Wembley, 1994 at Wembley, 1995 at Wembley, all against Australia. All massive, yeah. brilliant games. I think all, the Aussies wanted to play at Wembley as well. They're all 50, 60, 70,000 crowds. <clears throat> that is, I mean, the, how many times have we played Australia in London in the last 20 years? I think it's twice. Yeah, mm. I don't think you can... It, I can't remember. And the, the fact, we haven't even played Australia at all in seven years. No, no, you're, is, you're right, absolutely It's right. insane. It's, um, so that would be my one thing of, of having regular big international fixture in London every year. I mean, when we have a big fixture here, you get the crowds out. Yeah, yeah. Emirates last year, you're getting over 40,000. It's the biggest crowds that generally turn up at the, when the games are in London. So, and that then does get some media interest around it. You can get anybody who's interested at all to come along to those games and then build off some interest off the back of that. So, yeah, lots, lots of different avenues there that, you know, definitely see mileage in. But you, touching on, you know, having the internationals there, I, I mentioned previously that one of my earliest memories was going to Wembley to watch the Challenge Cup final, you know, and I think I think there's Aussies there that want to play at, at Wembley because, you sure. know, it's just historical and it's just part. Of, and then also you look at where are the majority of Aussie expats and they're going to be here in the capital, you know what I mean? It just makes sense, but I, I don't understand why it's... Yeah, um, I'd, I don't know how the Australian. I mean, there's there's obviously there's a big base of Australians yeah. in London. I'm never quite sure how much of that base are real rugby league yeah, yeah. people because of the the mix of the people within there. You end up with a lot of rugby union people. You end up if you're from Melbourne, then obviously AFL fans in that. Mm. So, but there's definitely a core of people in there. And, you know, then you have got a few clubs. So you got the your Hammersmith Hill Hoist and people like that. So you got a bunch of Australians there. You actually got a bunch of English people. In there as well, so you, you've got a, a you know bit of a core of core there, but also a lot of English people in there as well. And you now got one of the only amateur teams left in the fourth round of the Challenge Cup, so it's a really big deal. So there's actually mm -hmm. loads of things there, whether it's the Australians, whether it's the Northerners, but actually much more than anything else. There's also I do think in London, which I think is underappreciated. You know, they've been playing the game here for a hundred years. Yeah, they've been professional wow. team. It's a first Wembley final in 1929. They've been a professional team in London for nearly 50 years. Yeah. There have been periods in that time when, it, when it's played in a good location, in a good stadium, that's been there for a period of time where it's got a competitive team. Get big crowds. Mm. 
I went to watch them play Cronulla in 1997. They had 10,000 crowd there. And there are plenty, yeah, yeah. Of, plenty of times doing that where the, when, the, when the Broncos or under whichever, whether the Harlequins or whatever it was, we're getting big crowds. So there's, a, there's, you know, when you go to those, the Emirates game, like you say, you're, you're 40, 50,000 crowds when you're playing internationals here. We always hear that the TV figures on Sky are actually always pretty good in London. So there is a latent yeah. level of interest there. There's depth to it, isn't there? There's a depth to it. Mm. There's, a, there's a historical legacy and heritage around it, but it is dip- dispersed across the whole city and it's not necessarily front of mind and your number one activity thing to do for that many people. But it's, there's definitely a latent level of interest there that, I'm, that you know, really does make me think that if you invest in that properly, strategically over a long-term period of time, then you can get a massive, massive change out of that. Do you, um, think, it's, do you think it's harmed London Broncos as a club, the fact that they have moved around so many times, the fact that they have rebranded so many times, and if so, where do you think their best base is? Do you think it's where they're based now in Wimbledon? Do you think that's where they... I'm, I'm sure it's not helped over a yeah. long period of time moving around. It can't, can it? Because you just because London's such a big place. It's... Yeah, and, the, and if you look at the places that they've been to on that, um, it, it's pretty big spread on it. Um, so yeah, that that can't help over a long period of time. I'm sure there were there were very sensible reasons for why they did each of those moves at each of those individual periods of time but it, you know it's obviously then when you look at it over a long period of time not been ideal I do think where they are now is a brilliant spot yeah because I think that the stadium is a brilliant stadium uh, it, it, accessibility is actually pretty good there um, you've got three community clubs that are all relatively close to it I think it's it's reasonably accessible for, for most which of the others are, to get which to as well which three clubs so are Bri- Brixton Bulls Elmbridge Eagles and uh, Bromley Bengals right are all, are all that South London yeah. area-ish um, and then you know the population around there is you know there's um, two to three million people live within five miles of there <laughs> so it's not yeah, yeah, it's now that then would bring me on to the the IMG comment. So within there, you had the the catchment area criteria within that. So the catchment area they're designated for is Merton Borough Council, two hundred and fifteen thousand people. Now the next door council, which so the criteria on that were if you're over two hundred and sixty thousand people, then you got into the next score that had got an extra half a point. Yeah, on that. So they're at 215 on Merton, over 260 on that. The next council along is Wandsworth, who's got 325,000 people. Now, you know how far they are from Wandsworth? No. 10 metres. <laughs> it might be 15, it depends yeah, where you yeah. draw so, it from so, the edge so, of the so, stuff. So you found a chink in uh, a bit of a so, problem there, haven't you? <laughs> I mean, so to be designated on that obviously seems... A yeah, there should be like a, an exception there, shouldn't they? You know, you, you would have thought you look it, at likes of clubs that you know Leeds, Castleford, very, very close. Yeah, you can Wigan see, Saints. you can see why they've done it for like Wakefield, Castleford, yeah, yeah, going there, right. That's your catchment here. area. That's your catchment area. But there isn't another. <laughs> so the fact <laughs> that London, London is not getting a top score on however you've done the catchment area yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, criteria just, seems like a slight anomaly crazy. in the, in the system that you it wouldn't have be been on the wit of somebody to be able to adjust so for that's that. just so a I, lack of knowledge do you think oh, no, I, I, mean, I don't know I don't know I wouldn't want to I'm sure they've, yeah. they've you know they've done the best that they can do on that but um, <laughs> you would have thought that you could come come up with something like that um, so you know I, I, I am very hopeful for where they're playing at the moment I think it is a great spot I think it's a, it's a great catchment area there's a lot of people there's a lot of broader rugby interest in the whole area you've got rugby league interest in that area um so it's then just going to be a shame if they're not able to stay in Super League yeah, and really capitalise on that because, you know, it's a nine, ten thousand 10,000-seater stadium. You don't want to be a 1,000 people rattling mm-hmm. around in it. You want a, a good crowd in it watching top-quality games and top-quality players. Rick, the, the children that, or the kids that you work with, including your own, are they... Are they supporters of the Broncos? Are they Broncos fans, or are they? Did they My lads are fans? actually. Are they? And are you? Yeah. A, are you no, a Broncos fan? Well, I'm from Warrington, so I've been a Warrington fan. But are they but, your second? But Broncos club? are obviously my second yeah. team. Yeah. yeah. And yes, yeah, so I and so I, um, 
when I moved to London in 97 and Broncos had just been put in the yeah. Super League at the time, I'm like super excited. Yeah, so I'm yeah. coming down yeah. on a Friday night. Yeah, and, exciting times as well for London, wasn't it? Then? And it was exciting yeah. times and I had big crowds and I had, I had a mate of mine who was on the fringes of the team as well and we'd come down and, and watch that and I'd be dragging people down. So I've been going to watch them ever since then and you know, I wouldn't say that I've been going regularly to yeah. every game, but yeah. I've, I've been following it pretty closely. My, my lads would say that they are fans of it and they were coming along and super excited they bring the boots along and get it signed by the players at the end of the game and the players they're crack. I don't think anybody I've ever signed anybody's boots <laughs> in my life before my lad is going oh wow I've, I've got Dean Parata's signature yeah. on my things yeah. I've got Ollie Leyland's giving me his tags or whatever it is you just mentioned some local names there you know that your, your kids that are coming up and do they look up to these because there's a lot of London based players in the Broncos isn't there so I think that they I mean below the under 12s and whatever they wouldn't know no no but in place. you know I think that the older than that they are aware uh, you know and the kids who are, who are thinking of taking it seriously they are aware that then there is a Broncos pathway that there is there seems to be quite a lot of the kids who've come through playing the London Junior League, who've then gone through into the Broncos pathway, who've then gone on to play for the Broncos, they've gone on to play other Super League clubs, they've gone on to play for England. Yeah. And so there is a, a, a bit of an awareness around that, around the people who, who are interested in it. But those kids are also, a lot of them might be in the Harlequins setup or they might be in the Saracens yeah. setup as well. So, you know, you've got to be... Do you think that some Broncos could capitalise on a bit more, marketing-wise? I, yeah, I think they probably could. So I think that, you know, because those, those setups take a lot of kids in overall, and they aren't all going to go and play for Harlequins. They aren't all no, going to go and play for Saracens, and there's going to be some brilliant players well, in could, there. Well, you could flip it and say the majority won't. Well, the vast, vast, vast yeah, majority yeah. Yeah, yeah. won't. You know, 99% of them won't. But they don't just disappear. They go somewhere, don't they? So they go, but a lot of them end up, they might not go somewhere. And so I think that there is, it, it, you know, so it's up to us at the community clubs probably a little bit on the Broncos of just making sure that everybody, all of those players all know that going on the London Broncos pathway is a genuine alternative that can lead you to really, really good places that you can be Kai Pierce Paul. And one minute you're in, yeah. you've come out of Croydon and then you play in community club in the London Junior League and then you're in the Broncos nice. setup, but then you're playing the Broncos and then you're playing at Wigan and then you're playing at Newcastle Knights. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're a massive star and you're earning good money in being a really big deal. And that is a genuine option for all of these guys. And, and you know, it's up to us, like I say, at the community clubs and then up to the Broncos um, in order to make sure that as many of those kids, that all of those kids know that that's a real option for doing that. And that's a genuine opportunity for them. Rick, just cast your mind back over the years then of London Broncos. Who, who's been your kind of favourite players that have, that have pulled on the shirt? Oh. The many shirts that have been <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I loved it when Henry Paul was playing here. Yeah, quality. Yeah. Loved it when Henry Paul was playing here. I mean, in that team, you had proper players playing that team. You had Henry Paul and you had Scott Hill and you had. Some... Well, this is what I mean. I was thinking before that, you know, th there was obviously a lure to bring those big players to London. You know what I mean? Because there was some big, big talent. Martin Afire. Yeah, so, they, coming yeah, so, so obviously, so when Martin Afire were, and Martin Afire and Sean Edwards came here down in the late nights. And they had a couple of, they had a few young English lads who'd come through at the same time there as well. So A.D. Spencer, uh, I don't know if you remember. I vaguely remember the name. So he, and, and so he'd come from Cambridge University and come down here and another a mate of our school, Ian Higgins, who played half a dozen games around the same time. So they had, playing them with Sean Edwards and Martin Afire in, in that <coughs> setup then. Um, then mid 2000s when you had you guys like Henry Paul had really good players come through you know when they signed Craig Gower Craig who'd Gower, come off playing State of Origin in Australia and, and all of that and so they've been really big players over a period of time um, now at the moment you've now got loads of lads who've come through the Junior League system London lads come through playing community clubs who are all playing out there uh, you know I really really hope that Ollie Leyland gets a good run this year, I think he's a super lad. I was absolutely gutted for Bill that he's going to miss a year. That they came and talked to our London Foundation fundraiser that an awards do that we come in November, and they were really good super lads. So, you know, I hope that, the, that there's a bunch of those 
London lads who've come through the system who are now going to get a proper look at Super League. Yeah. yeah. You know, you go from playing part time in front of thousand people down here, and next thing you know, you're playing in front of fifteen thousand people in Huge St Helens yeah. on yeah. live TV, and that's a, a big deal. So I hope that they that they get a really good run out of that, and that goes really well for them. Switching switching lanes uh, to to Warrington. Yeah. What what is your kind of feeling this year on on Warrington's team? <laughs> we, we can't. We, you know, we can't. Don't say the catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. I, I mean, it doesn't strike me that the team is massively different this year than last year. Um, so I, I wouldn't have thought it's going to really strike fear into... Yeah, I'm sure that they'll be very capable and they'll be confident they'll win a, a, a fair number of games. Um, it, it's not obvious that they've got enough real top-level quality that you that they're really going to be pushing at the end of the season but coach will have to get a shirt on won't he? coach will have, well I did wonder about that I'm sitting there watching you going, well, I hope you brought your boots because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that can make a big difference yeah. um, so I don't know we'll, we'll see just quite topical obviously we're going through this thing early stages of Super League loads of cards getting dished out for, for head eye tackles yeah. and, and all this kind of stuff has that kind of permeated down into the? I know you've not played any games yet this year but are you already are you incorporate that into the community game in London and also the kids that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, we are, I would say, you know, we've always been trying to teach tackle technique where people are, are getting low enough and you're hitting below the ball and, and around the thighs or around um, the stomach. I think it's reinforced that more than anything else. And, you know, you'd have a few kids who would be standing upright and grabbing people around the arms and whatever and so you're just trying to reinforce that that you know you really you can't you can't do that at all it's just not um part of it anymore um so i think that that that's probably the bit of practical level from a from a coaching level you know i think that the the whole issue um is obviously it's it's a massive issue you know i went and gave i was talking at brixton bulls in a primary school a few months ago and questions at the end and one lad puts his hand up and says, doesn't play in rugby give you brain damage? Wow. I think he was probably nine or 10. And uh, you're like, well, it can do (laughs) under certain circumstances if if you don't manage it well and manage it properly, but we're trying to put everything in place so that we are managing it well and we are treating it properly and we recognize all of the risks around that and we try and mitigate all of those risks. But, you know, there's obviously... Well, explaining that to a nine-year-old isn't great. You hope you can explain it to his parents, but, you know, there's obviously... A, a genuine issue around all of that. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll see how it then ends up getting refereed. So I, I help out coaching under 11s rugby union as well. And they obviously last year brought in the yeah. tackle height being, they ended up settling on the sternum. Um, so you have to look up the sternum and then you <laughs> figure out where it was. Um, and I think that, you know, there's no doubt that introducing that rule has generally lowered the tackle height yeah. from where it was before. Now, it's not that obvious of how strictly some games it's referee strictly, some games it's not, but it has lowered the tackle height in general, which is probably the right thing to happen and, and is helpful. So I'd imagine you end up getting something similar um, in the rugby league setup. But obviously, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to do everything that you can do. So the days of people having a bang around the head and you're, you're all right. Yeah, back on. Fella, you're back on. Yeah. We can't do without you. And obviously, you have to, can't do it. Yeah. Do you uh, think it's had any effect on Rugby Union in lowering the um, the attendance numbers at the clubs? Uh, uh, I mean, I think that the, it's, so I, I don't know the numbers particularly. People tell me that the uh, junior numbers in Rugby Union have been sliding over a period of time. I don't know if that's actually right or not, I, I, but I suspect within that, then the um, the concussion issue, I would have thought, is would be one contributor in fact, yeah. to that is probably not helping. But I, I, I wouldn't know that much more than that. I think you know they're dealing with it. Rugby league is dealing with it. Football's having to deal with it. Uh, it's a real issue, and, and that we've got to deal with. Well, Rick, it's been incredible talking to you. Um, every week we ask 
the uh, the guest to set a question for the oncoming guest. Yeah, all right. All right, and they range from all different topics. Um, the the question that was set by your friend Kevin Rudd before was, uh, can you name the the seven members of the or the seven actors in the magnificent magnificent seven? Sure. There was a, there was a follow up question as well. So if you really struggle, we'll hit that. <laughs> well, the answer the, the follow up an- question is harder. <laughs> the answer to the question is no, no. I can't. So so I think I've passed that. Yeah. Uh, I'd go I'd go as far as Yul Brunner and Robert Wagner. Probably pretty close. Right? I, I'd get so I get two. Yeah. Not was Charles Bronson in that one as well. I might yeah, get three. Charles Bronson, yeah, three. I might yeah. I might struggle after three. No, you no, know, you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna bloody clue. All right. Well, the, the the second question, which is the only country to ban a sport, and what was the what was the country and what was the well, sport? Well, I'm guessing it's France, and I'm guessing it's rugby league. G- Greece and uh, Greece and rugby league. Greece and rugby league. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll go yeah. France as well. I thought France as well. I think France they did, they did definitely tried to kick it out, didn't they? I thought they I thought they, they, I thought banned, they banned it, it in the war. The, the, the Nazis outlawed. Right. outlawed it. Didn't they? I thought the Vichy government, yeah, yeah. yeah under the yeah. control of the Nazis, oh, banned it during the war. There's a. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we want to get dragged into. So we're going to have to look into. (laughs) (laughs) We never know the bloody answers. I don't know why we do it. Okay, Rick. Listen, it's been an absolute privilege to uh, to chat to you today. Thanks, guys. To learn more about Brixton Bulls and also, you know, the stuff that you're doing in the wine community, especially the youngsters, because we all know that that's where that's where it really counts and you can make a big difference. So. Um, thanks for taking some time out and chatting to us. Yeah, well, me, Rick, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, Brixton seems to be a club that is just doing wonderful things in the community, um, which is what you touched on, which sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, keep up the hard work. Um, Thank you. And, and everybody else at the club that's you know, putting so much time and dedication. And yeah, cheers for joining us. Well, thanks, guys. And we appreciate, appreciate having us on and appreciate everything that you guys are doing as well. You know, I think, it, you know, everything that we can do the better together yeah brilliant Cheers, thank, you. thank you that's the final whistle for this week's episode of the rugby league outsiders we hope you've enjoyed it don't forget to follow us on social media and share this podcast with your friends and as always if you have a story to tell a club to plug or a player that deserves recognition we want to hear from you so until next time on the rugby league outsiders take care